Hi, I'm here in Westminster with Cheryl Gillen, MP, Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Autism. Hello, Cheryl. Great to have you here. Can I begin by asking you, um, you you've been speaking about autism for several years now. Yes. Um, can I ask you what drew you to this? Do you have a personal connection with autism? What, what interested you in this in the first place? Well, my first, uh, my first encounter with autism was back in 1992 when I was first elected to the House of Commons. And I was elected with another female colleague called Angela Browning, who is now in the House of Lords, mm. Baroness Browning. And within a week or so, uh, she introduced me to her lovely son, Robin. And Robin walked up to me and he said, Cheryl Elise Kendall Gillen, 21st of April 1952, 22,220. And I'd never met him before. And I said, how do you do that, Robin? He said, oh, I can do that for all the newly elected MPs. And of course, that was the first person that I'd met that I was aware of that had autism. And of course, being a friend of Angela's, I've always followed Robin's development with interest. And then I was fortunate enough in 2008 to draw the first bill in the private member's bill ballot. And that's a bit like winning the lottery here in Westminster. We voted for the bill and got that second reading and got the first disability specific piece of legislation in this country, the Autism Act 2009, on the statute book. And that is just the start, mm. really, because um, there's still a lot to do. We've done, we've done a lot since 2009, yes. we've come a long way, but we're coming up to the 10th anniversary in 2019 of that bill, and, um, or of the NOW Act, and I'm hoping that we will make a, a, a great contribution to the government in terms of what we want doing still in the future, and also consolidating those victories that we've achieved over the years. Mm. And, and you say there's a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of work still to do, and um, one of the areas where that's true, um, and, and which you've spoken about as well, is an area that we're very much involved in, and that's, that's the very early diagnosis and, and um, intervention in autism. Well, you will know from your own personal experience, um, and also I think every Member of Parliament will know from their surgeries, we tend to see families in crisis, uh, and we see families when they're wanting emergency mm. intervention. And one of the things that I've found over the years in common, and, and many of the autism charities um, agree on this, is that we have a large number of people that are undiagnosed. And although diagnosis in itself is not a cure, getting an early diagnosis opens up access to all sorts of services and opens up access for the family and the individual um, who is on the spectrum. And getting that diagnosis still seems to be a huge battle. And of course, you've then only got to talk to families and individuals when they've had that diagnosis um, to know, first of all, the relief, actually sometimes being able to put a name to what is happening with their child, um, but also um, the ability then to find an explanation for, for what is happening in their family and what is happening with that individual. So that is, in itself, is a, is a great step forward yeah. um, in, in a personal world uh, where somebody has autism. Three years, four years, actually sometimes longer, we're still seeing now diagnoses of adults, mm -hmm. um, and particularly that brings great relief Yes. Um, I've, I've actually heard someone say, I didn't know what, what the matter was with me, why I didn't connect mm -hmm. with the world, why I felt so excluded. Now I have an explanation, I actually feel as if I belong. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's an extraordinarily um, great breakthrough for individuals because one of the things I think is really important is that every individual is able to fulfill their potential, no matter where they are on the spectrum. And we know there are comorbidities, and we know that there are other issues and, and problems that you find alongside sometimes with autism. Um, but that is, I think, a, um, a, an admirable aim um, for any government and any society and any set of institutions to try and enable people to fulfill their potential. And, yes. and that is, I think, very important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and. I guess you talked about the sense of relief that adults get. Um, I guess if the um, diagnosis was brought forward and they, they were able to be diagnosed much young, younger, it would save a lot of stress during their lives, so there would be less to be relieved from. 
Well, an early diagnosis is, um, is really essential in many cases, mm. um, particularly in the field of education um, and behaviour, obviously. It, it provides an explanation. It also provides the ability for people um, to, to be able to explain the behaviour of, of certain young individuals so that they can maximise from the education system. And uh, I think the earlier a diagnosis is obtained and the earlier, it's not putting a label on it, but it's actually um, enabling yes. um, the people that surround that young person yes. to um, provide them with the appropriate um, circumstances in which they can learn or live or, or behave. If you have a child that is overwhelmed um, in the classroom, usually they end up being excluded or being, being, being removed from the school and that is not always the best path. Yeah. I think if, if a school and a head teacher and teachers are aware um, of what autism can mean, um, then the chances are of that child successfully going through the education system, this is one way, I'm just giving you one example, um, is, is much greater. Yeah. So I think that is just one small element where I think early diagnosis will help. Yeah. And, and we have this with my son in his school at the moment. It's so important for the staff to understand that he has autism because then the way that they approach it and they deal with his behaviour is different from how they would deal, deal with the same behaviour mm. in a non-autistic child. Well, we've been very keen on that. And one of the things that we have achieved through pressure, I think, from the all-party parliamentary group on autism, which is cross-party, I stress, this is not a political um, angle at all, um, and through the organisations that um, we work with, uh, the government is building in autism training into initial teacher training from 2018. Mm. Yeah. And of course, in the meantime, as you know, there's a huge program which is being carried out by um, another charity of educating teachers that are currently teaching, because of course they won't have got through yeah. that at initial teacher training. Um, and I think that that is really, really important and was one of our successes, I felt, mm. and uh, we got a very positive response from government, which I was delighted with. Why do you think there hasn't been more progress towards earlier intervention? Why do you think there's, you know, a lot of parents experience some sort of almost resistance and, or reluctance to diagnose at an early age? Well, I think there, there are many reasons, um, quite frankly, um, and uh, I, I, I can only speculate and, and speak from experiences that I've had. First of all, GP training um, does not really cover autism in a big way, and of course you start with your GP, don't you? Yeah. So it is quite quite difficult, and there are seems to be different attitudes throughout the health service towards um, autism diagnoses. Um, I think we need to make sure that that is built in thoroughly into GP's training, as we're doing for initial teacher training. Mm. Um, I've talked to um, some of the Royal Colleges um, uh, about uh, what can be built into medical training and I hope that there will be an improvement in what is built into medical training uh, so that people can understand autism better. Um, I think there's also um, a huge demand on the resources of local authorities and social services and there is possibly um, a feeling that once a diagnosis is obtained um, there is going to be more demand for the resources available. I don't take that as, um, a, as an excuse at all, but um, there is some thought that that might be the case. And, and we're working with um, a partner organisation in, in Israel, another non-profit over there, and it seems that in Israel they have, um, they have an extra step in the process that um, it, could, you know, it could be helpful in the face of uh, the long waiting times that currently exist here, whether it's for, for under-resourcing or whether it's because of um, the skills not being um, being there in sufficient numbers, and that's they have a, a, an initial step of uh, a suggested uh, um, suspected autism. It's like an interim diagnosis, mm. and that's not a definitive um, diagnosis, but it unlocks access to some mm. services. Well, I'd be very interested in looking at that, mm. um, and I haven't come across it, of course. And in terms of autism policy, where do you see that going in the near future? I have an aim that there should be nobody that works in the public sector that engages with the public that isn't aware of autism and doesn't have some basic training in autism. In the same way as we're training up our teachers, we're trying to get our prison officers, um, we need to get our health service workers. Um, anybody that comes in contact with the, with the general public, whether you're in the job centre and the Department of Work and Pensions or in Customs and Excise and handling tax cases, I think everybody that is public facing should have an awareness and should have a basic training 
and recognize that there are some people they may meet in the course of their, their work who will be on the spectrum and they should adjust accordingly if possible. And, and in terms of the um, APPGA, mm -hmm. um, what's on the roadmap? You know, what, what, are the, what are the things you're going to be concerned Well, we just with? started again because we had this general election and so we have just had our annual general meeting and I'm very pleased that I was put back in the chair um, and I've got all my vice presidents. We have seamlessly continued our education um, commission, which has been um, run by um, two, of my, um, two of my members, um, two members of parliament. And so the first thing will be out will be a report on, on what they have discovered because we're trying to improve right across the board in education. Um, I, I would very much like to continue as a, as a matter of urgency our work that we've been doing on employment because uh, as our economy is, is, is strong and growing and as we're going um, into a, a period of independence when we come out of the European Union, I want to make sure that people with autism that can work are not disadvantaged in the recruitment process mm -hmm. um, and, and that firms are, uh, understand the benefits they can have from, from employing people on the spectrum. In fact, there are, uh, there are some firms um, that uh, specifically look for people with some of the fantastic blessings that some people with autism have but it's not all rain man and it's not all yeah. um, it's not the romantic thing you see in uh, in, in the movies yeah. um, they are people with real skills but sometimes have difficulty engaging yes. in in their social skills and um, but we need to make sure that, that understanding is, is passed across to employers as yes. well Cheryl Gill thank you very much for joining us it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you